I sincerely believe that what we have done in the past as a nation, overtly and covertly, is a direct reflection on the kind of people that we are. And I feel obligated to help set the record straight so that we know what we are and what are our evils so we can divest ourselves of those evils and become again a great nation. I don't want to live like a beggar for justice. I don't think it's becoming of this country. But all those lies that have been told to me and to other people, it's a very bad foundation for our society and nothing based on lies can withstand very long. I do not want my children and my grandchildren to grow up in a country where the people are lied to or something is covered up. The American people can handle the truth it's been that way since the day we were born. All we need is the truth. Let's put it to rest. Most Americans believe the truth surrounding the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy has been covered up. Marina Oswald is convinced that her late husband, Lee, played no part in his murder. I think he's absolutely innocent of the murder of President Kennedy or Officer Tippett. And I would like for uh, people in official capacity who say that he is guilty to come up with the proof. Absolutely. Not one-sided, but all evidence on the table. And only then to decide if he's guilty or innocent. I know he's innocent. But the, the danger of the truth not being known Will, will destroy this nation, actually. They maybe don't believe me, but that's the fact. Beverly Hills is home to a former member of the 1970s House Select Committee on Assassinations, the second major inquiry into the killing of Kennedy. He resigned with others when their efforts to establish the truth were thwarted. Attorney and former mayor of Beverly Hills, Bob Tannenbaum, the executive intelligence agencies, the FBI and the CIA, predominantly looked upon the committee as the enemy. They were not there to help us, to give us the information we needed, and made it very difficult to obtain anything. And, and the material they did give us was severely redacted, that is, deleted documents. Uh, and all we really wanted were the documents done by the investigators, uh, as they would do in the ordinary course, investigating any homicide. Wherever the facts led us, we would go and we would report on that. And as I said, if those facts told us that Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated the president and he acted alone, we would have said that. If it were that Lee Harvey Oswald acted with others, we would have said it. And if it was that others killed the president and not Lee Harvey Oswald, and that w those were the facts, we would have said it. How did they frustrate us? They weren't interested in subpoenaing people who were critical to the investigation and people who were subpoenaed, who were lying to the committee, who were in the government, and not doing the right thing. What was the right thing? To hold them in contempt and to charge perjury. That required a vote of the committee, a vote of the House of Representatives, and a submission to the U.S. Attorney's Office. They weren't prepared to do that because they really didn't want to find out the truth publicly. And when you, hum when you have a homicide investigation, you're either involved in the truth-finding process or you get out of the business. So the government maintains the case is closed. It's left to lone individuals to pursue the truth and it's a long and arduous journey across a bleak landscape. One such pilgrim is now revealing previously hidden information using the latest computer technology. Tom Wilson spent 30 years with US Steel, developing his image processing techniques for revealing imperfections in product surfaces. His expert evidence in murder cases involving gunshot wounds has been accepted in federal court. In 1988, he began to apply that expertise to images from the Kennedy assassination. You look at a picture and you see 30 shades of diversifying gray, whereas the machinery sees 256. As you peel away the layers of the photograph as you were peeling an onion, each of the layers provides to the human being some information that lie within these various layers and each layer or combination of layers 
will result in something that is embedded in there that has not been able to be brought out by the human eye. I don't think anyone has ever utilized the equipment to look at the Kennedy images, because if they have, with the expertise that I know our government has had over the past many years, then I know they will come to the same absolute conclusion that I have. And it's just been an unbelievable burden ever since, because I know, I know that President Kennedy was assassinated by somebody from the front and that there was a conspiracy. And the problem hasn't been the burden of knowing the truth that our president was assassinated in a conspiracy. The problem has been that in my efforts to bring hard, scientific, technical information to the public has been thwarted by everywhere I have turned. I've tried the media. I've tried the government. I've tried everything I know. And no one wants to look at the evidence. Using image processing techniques, undreamt of when Zapruder filmed the assassination, Tom has uncovered dramatic information hidden within this horrific footage. As we go further into the brain, we are able to observe all of the damage that has occurred in this rear exit wound from the very top of the skull down into where the missile exited through the head. As you can see, this is the scalp area, the damage to the skull, the area of the skull that's been blown away by the incoming frontal missile. And now we can actually go down and see the brain and the exiting bullet has gone through the brain and you can see the path of the bullet here. Lee Harvey Oswald did not and could not have fired the fatal shot that killed our president. Tom Wilson's ability to extract hidden information from the assassination pictures is based on established scientific principles. This is photonics. This is the absolute science and the measurement of light. What is in these photographs and what is measured by the computer and backed up by hard scientific mathematical data, all of my findings can be reproduced. Badge Man shooting from the grassy knoll was first revealed in Mary Mormon's picture in The Men Who Killed Kennedy in 1988. Tom's initial work confirmed his presence. This encouraged him to apply his technology to photographic records of the assassination. The Zapruder film allowed me to be able to uh, go in and look at the head wound initially. The autopsy photographs allowed me to verify that there were inconsistencies within, and the pristine Mary Mormon photograph allowed me to go in and actually measure the wound optically without image processing. As we go into the wound and as we expand the wound and magnify it, you can see that the pixel elements or each one of these little dots is represented by dark squares or light squares. Now, if there were no wound in the rear of President Kennedy's head, all of the squares would be the basic reflective value or the basic shade of gray that his normal hair coloring would be on this day. Every time, every time in my years of experience with this, when there is a concave or convex area that is a deformation of the overall image, there is absolutely no question that the case is as it goes darker under this situation, that this is going from an, an area on the top of President Kennedy's head down into an extremely deep hole because the entrance wound that supported this exit wound was fired from the right frontal area of President Kennedy and it exited through the rear. Instead of trying to find shooters or gunmen in the photographs, I decided to concentrate on President Kennedy's massive rear end head wound. And what this enabled me to do was to be able to go in, rebuild the head wound as a mold, use the data thereof, and track back from the head wound back to the source of the shooter. 
This is the mold that was reproduced from the data points obtained from the pristine Mary Mormon photograph. I took eight vertical scans, one, two, and so forth, down to the bottom, and 750 horizontal scans, which allowed me to have 6,000 pieces of mathematical data that I could actually turn into a three-dimensional mold. I was able to produce the exact replica, not to scale, of course, but an exact replica of President Kennedy's head wound. As you can see, this allowed me to be able to show the massive amount of material that was blown from the head into the air. As the bullet entered the right temporal area, it came within his head and fragmented into two directions. The right fragment is here, the left fragment is here. And this allowed me to determine, as you can see with all the flow of forces here, that all of the material was blown up and the entrance of the fragments came from below. Having gathered extensive mathematical data from the assassination images, Tom went to Dealey Plaza for the first time. Taking precise measurements from the site, he correlated these with his photographic findings. The results were not as he anticipated. When I came back and took these coordinates, which were mapped out using the machinery, not manual calculation, I could never put President Kennedy at the spot where the Zapruder film said was frame 313 when Badge Man was firing because the projectile trajectory from Badge Man wasn't where Kennedy was. And when I put President Kennedy down the road four feet further, when Badge Man could hit him, Mary Mormon was in the wrong location, Mr. Zapruder wouldn't fit, the fence was in the wrong place. I could not make anything fit. So I had to go back to Dallas, and I had to run more tests. And what I found out was something that I had overlooked all this time in looking at the photograph. President Kennedy's wound in his right temporal area is at an angle like this. It's coming out of the ground. And I said to myself, Tom, if the bullet was coming out of the ground, how is this possible? Because I never tried to determine where the bullet came from. I only know what it did to President Kennedy's head. This totally bewildered me that I'm at the end of this mission. President Kennedy was assassinated by a man firing a missile from inside the manhole cover at the bottom of the steps in Dealey Plaza. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that that is exactly where that headshot came from. Jack Brazil, a seasoned researcher of the assassination, believes that a gunman firing at Kennedy from the storm sewer is no wild theory. In 1992, he put his ideas to the test with a trained military team. They explored the subterranean world beneath Dealey Plaza. After carefully analyzing and researching Dealey Plaza through the years, the only two spots that an assassin could actually hide and squeeze off around at the presidential limousine would be the storm sewer that I'm standing in now and the storm drain, which is located directly behind the wooden picket fence that uh, joins the uh, triple underpass. But that's the only two spots that uh, an assassin could, uh, could hide in and actually squeeze off around and uh, uh, fire at the presidential limousine and, and then, in lieu of that, been able to escape. It took us approximately 53 to 54 minutes, our very, our very first trip. Now that was stopping and uh, 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 investigating and talking on the walkie-talkies, two coffee breaks, and then the second time it took 42 minutes, and the third trip it took 32 minutes, and the fourth trip it took 23 minutes. So we can rest assured that it would take an assassin approximately 20 to 30 minutes to actually escape Dealey Plaza underground. This uh, ties in to the storm sewer in the center of Main Street, and it's easily 
accessible for a would-be assassin, and he could very easily have shot the president and used this route for an escape, which leads directly to the Trinity River. The official autopsy photographs taken at Bethesda Naval Hospital on the evening of the assassination show no indication of a frontal entrance wound to Kennedy's head or exit wound from the rear. However, Tom Wilson has uncovered new evidence showing that these images have been manipulated to support the official line of a lone gunman firing from behind. The dark areas represent material that are human and or environmental the white areas represent morticious materials such as wax. Some of the obvious areas of disguise are the ear, where you can see the wax material has been over top of the human ear. The entire face has been covered with mortician's wax and materials. And most important, the right temporal area, which is the entrance area of the incoming missile, has been filled with mortician's wax. I'm not saying that restorative art was not done to President Kennedy before he was buried. What I'm saying is, how can an autopsy photograph have restorative art on a cadaver? Tom can prove that another official autopsy photograph first seen in the men who killed Kennedy and showing the back of the president's head intact has been forged. When image processing looks at this image, the real image that should be seen is this image. And all of the area that looks like it is solid white and nice evenly coated white is a photographic manipulation of the image it is not a man-made mortician type material. It is a painted image on a photograph. It is my concerted opinion that this photograph was manipulated for only one thing, and that was to hide the massive exit wound that occurred in the rear of President Kennedy's head. Lieutenant Colonel Dan Marvin has spent his life serving his country. A veteran of eight combat campaigns, he earned 21 awards and decorations. 15 years a paratrooper, he served in the elite special forces, the Green Berets. Just a few weeks after the assassination, he volunteered for specialist guerrilla training at Fort Bragg. Almost all of the instruction in the guerrilla warfare school was classified. Uh, the most secret was the top secret training on assassinations and terrorism. And at that time, we went to a different building that had a double uh, barbed wire fence around it and, and guard dogs in it. On the John F. Kennedy situation, that was uh, brought to our attention as a classic example of the way to organize a, a complete uh, program to eliminate a nation's leader uh, while pointing the finger at a lone assassin. It involved also uh, the cover-up uh, of the assassination itself. We had considerable detail. They had a, a, a mock layout of the, the plaza in that area and showed where the shooters were and, and where the routes were to the hospital. I don't remember where those were now. They had quite a bit of movie uh, film coverage. It seemed like, you know, thinking back to that time, and some still photos of the, the grassy knoll and, and places like that. They told us that um, Oswald was not involved in the shooting at all. He was the patsy. He was the one that was set up. We did, uh, myself and a friend of mine, form a very distinct impression that the CIA was involved in Kennedy's assassination. During a coffee break, we overheard one of the CIA instructors say to the other, things really did go well in Daly Plaza didn't it, or something to that effect. And that just reinforced or, or really added to our suspicions, and, and we really felt uh, before the end of the train was over that one of those instructors may have been involved himself in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, I had to do a lot of rethinking, uh, and, and perhaps, it's a, perhaps it's a way that soldiers of fortune are, I don't know, but I just then convinced myself, as did my friend, that it had to somehow be in the best interest of the United States government, the 
that Kennedy was killed. Otherwise, why would our own people have done it? Simple as that. At Fort Bragg, 15 months after his training, Dan was summoned to meet an official from the CIA, a company man. David Vanick, a fellow officer in assassination training, also attended. First, the company man took me aside and showed me his badge, his ID card, and he asked me if I would volunteer to kill a man, a United States citizen, a naval officer. Uh, he didn't tell me who it was at first. Now, I assumed what he was talking about was killing a man overseas. He asked me at first if I would accept an assignment to kill somebody. He didn't give me the name, but then I asked for the name, assuming it would be, like I said, overseas. And he gave me the name, William Bruce Pitzer. Hard name to forget, really, once you hear it. And so uh, I told him yes. And, and then he said, we have to, um, he started to lay out the details of it. And the details included the fact that I would have to get him before he retired. And he retired in a very short period of time, if I remember correctly, and he was stationed at Bethesda Naval Hospital. So I'd have to actually get him here in the United States. Well, I refused because that wasn't the way that, that we were trained that this was going to happen. We were supposed to be used as their assets, the CIA's assets, for use in assassinations overseas. In the United States, the mafia was supposed to supply what resources they need for killing somebody here in the United States. So he then asked David Vanek. He went over to David Vanek and talked to him. Now, I don't know what he talked to David Vanek about. He might ask him, the price of ice cream, I don't know. But I never saw David Vanek after that day. Now that was in August, the first week of August of 1965. In November 1963, William Bruce Pitzer was head of the audiovisual unit at Bethesda Naval Hospital. A close colleague at the time was a young petty officer, Dennis David. Three or four days after the assassination, I walked in uh, his office and I saw he was working on some uh, film. He had a movie editor, one of those reel-to-reel -reel that runs across to the screen, and he showed it to me, and it was a 16-millimeter film of the autopsy. There were also some slides. He had some slides that he had uh, that showed uh, of tissue slides and also showed some slides of, of President Kennedy uh, that were taken while, uh, from, while he was on the uh, table at the morgue. And, uh, you know, we looked at him, uh, kind of horrified, I guess you would say, at the seriousness of the wound. But I remember one of the things that I remembered uh, was that we saw, they had a, a picture of Kennedy laying on the table, and it was a front profile, if you will, or front view. And the only thing we saw was a little hole about here in the temple. And... Uh, then and some and another photograph or another uh, slide that Bill had uh, was saying, showed a huge gaping hole here in the back, and so Bill and I logically assumed that uh, the wound was a frontal entry wound, uh, as opposed to what the Warren Commission later said, being a uh, shot from behind. Dennis left Bethesda for a new posting. But in November 1966, a colleague gave him some distressing news regarding his old friend, Bill Pitzer. He'd been found dead in a pool of blood in his studio at Bethesda. The official verdict was suicide. Lying face down on the floor, a 38 revolver by his side, he had a bullet wound in the right temple. When the occupational therapist had told me this, I remember I reminded him, you know, that doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense because Bill was left-handed and, you know, uh, because we used to kid him all the time when playing bridge about being a southpaw, because sometimes he'd deal in reverse instead of dealing him in the correct uh, sequence, he'd deal him in the opposite way, and we'd, we'd kind of harass him about it. There are grave doubts about Pitzer's alleged suicide. His left hand had been so mangled, as if tortured, that his wedding ring could not be removed and given to his widow. Bill had told me shortly before I had he left Bethesda, which was around the 7th of December, of 65, uh, he told me that he was planning on retiring because he had enough time in and he was wanting to get out. And that he also said he, he had some damn lucrative offers from uh, some TV networks. And uh, other, other people have asked me why I think he was assassinated. And, uh, and I think it was because that with him retiring, they were 
uh, they, and I don't know who they are, were afraid that he would take these f pictures that he and I had seen, this 35 millimeter and the uh, 16 millimeter film, that he was that he would take them and that the uh, if he went to work for a major studio that they would use them or he would have them aired and that would really you know blow some people out of the water if that would have transpired. I could be wrong. I could be all wet, but I do know those films exist because I was there. I saw the damn things. I, I am absolutely certain that the name that I was given underneath those pine trees in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in the first week of August was William Bruce Pitcher. I put it completely out of my mind from 1965 until 1993. And I was watching a special in November 93 about the assassination of Kennedy. I think it was, an, it was a special by Jack Anderson. And at the end of that special, on the television, they rolled an, a list of 42 names of people who had met a violent death that were somehow associated with the assassination or the cover-up or the autopsy or something. And I was sitting there in my living room watching that, and the name William Bruce Pitcher came over the screen. And it just, it made me go right back to that day in August of 1965. That was the William Bruce Pitcher that I was asked to kill, unless there's two William Bruce Pitchers that worked with Bethesda Naval Hospital. That man, the name of the other Green Beret that was approached by the CIA agent in August of 1965 at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, was David H. Vanek, captain. Uh, who went through the same training I did, same class I was in. And uh, I have tried, ever since I saw the name William Bruce Pitcher come out on that screen, I've tried to find him. Uh, and I, I've been totally unsuccessful. I sent to the letters to the special office and the retired services directorate where they mail, they'll mail, they take a letter that you send them with a man's, na man's name and serial number and they'll forward it to him. Or if he's deceased, they'll send it back to you. I got no response from them, so I finally sent another follow-up letter and demanded a response or I t threatened to go to Senator D'Amato to help me on the response. And then I did get a response, but the response was that, the, that David H. Vanek never existed in the United States Army. But Dan still has published army orders proving that Captain David H. Vanek was with him at the Special Warfare Center. Recognizing just what kind of a person I was, and which I am hopefully no longer, it is not an easy thing to do. It would be easier for me to just melt into the woodwork and let my family, especially my grandchildren, think of me as, as kind of a friendly old giant that helps them do things and plays with them rather than what I've done in the past. And I know that when this, if it is made public, the information that I've given will adversely affect my relations with my family. And I just hope and pray. that our love survives it. And I hope and pray that it does some good for this nation. Former FBI agent and professional investigator Bill Turner has been researching the JFK assassination since the weekend it happened. His exhaustive probing has given him exceptional insight into the events and reasons surrounding Kennedy's death. There was much anger over his failure to provide air cover at the Bay of Pigs. There was much anger uh, when he did not invade Cuba during the missile crisis in October 1962. After the Bay of Pigs, John Kennedy reamed out uh, the CIA for conducting too high a profile, uh, meaning an invasion. And he said he wanted to continue the campaign against Castro, but he wanted it so 
It was low profile and invisible. And so the Kennedy brothers did develop a secret agenda. And Bobby was a protagonist in which there would be a series of sabotage raids. Uh, there would be continued assassination attempts uh, against Castro. And there would be uh, teams ready to go into Cuba if the time was right to, for a second invasion. So all of this was low profile but high intensity and was going on right after the Bay of Pigs, right up until John Kennedy's death. Building on the foundations laid by Bill Turner, using classified documents newly released under the Kennedy Assassination Records Act, the investigation into the Kennedy brothers' secret agenda against Fidel Castro has been greatly extended. Project Freedom is the name given to that agenda by two Atlantan writers and researchers. Over the last seven years, Lamar Waldron has built up a formidable database on this secret agenda and its relationship to Kennedy's murder. Together with colleague Tom Hartman, they have gained unique access to individuals closest to these events and have unraveled some of the darkest secrets lying at the heart of the assassination. The Kennedys were determined to see some sort of action taken on Cuba one way or the other uh, before the end of 1963, primarily because they wanted to avoid Cuba becoming a political football during the 1964 campaigns, and those would, of course, be kicking off at the first uh, of the year of 1964. The reason that this came about was uh, the, the, the efforts against Castro, of course, started in 1959 under Richard Nixon. Um, Nixon wildly escalated them in 1960 in an attempt to have Castro assassinated prior to the election so that he could defeat Kennedy in the election. He was unsuccessful in that. Kennedy inherited many of these programs, which ultimately led to the Bay of Pigs and the debacle there. Uh, there was Project Mongoose, which Bobby, to a large extent, ex supported a CIA program. It didn't work. None of these programs worked. And so Bobby, in utter frustration uh, and, and I think progressively becoming less trustful of the people who had been running these programs up to this point, said, I'm going to take a, I'm going to create my own program. We are going to run this out of my office and it's going to be highly secure and highly compartmentalized, as it is to this day. Project Freedom, again, was, was Bobby Kennedy's project um, that he ran only with his most trusted advisors. So you had Bobby at the top, based in Washington, and also based much of the time in Washington, you had his Cuban confidant. That was Bobby's main liaison with the other small handful of exile leaders that he trusted to work on Project Freedom with him. Those leaders would sometimes contact Bobby directly, but most of the time they would go through his, his Cuban confidant. So a second invasion of Cuba was being planned using a force of Cuban exiles. Robert Kennedy's Cuban confidant was the man in charge. Harry Williams uh, was in the invasion brigade of the Bay of Pigs. And when he was recuperated from Cuba, uh, Bobby Kennedy tapped him to become kind of his golden boy with the exiles. And Harry, I can tell you, he has a tremendous presence, almost a charisma, if you want to call it that. And uh, so I did interview him, and uh, he told me that uh, the action was going to be based out of the Dominican Republic in a place called Monte Cristi. Uh, but the character changed when they cooperated or co opted a, a high official in Havana, and the opportunity for an assassination of Castro and a coup presented itself. So this is this developed along the line and uh, at that point the uh, second invasion became more of a backup type of idea. John Kennedy in his settlement with uh, Premier Khrushchev, the Soviet Union, the missile crisis in October of 1962 had agreed that there would be no U.S. involvement in any type of adverse actions uh, against Cuba. That was part of the agreement. So this had to be kept from the Soviet Union, it had to be kept from the FBI, it had to be kept uh, from anybody and anybody that didn't have a need to know. Harry was reporting directly to Bobby Kennedy. The United States in the summer and fall of 1963 had a great need to get more low-level intelligence assets into Cuba. One of the reasons the Bay of Pigs had failed was because we didn't have good intelligence that told us what the reaction of the Cuban people really would be when the invasion happened. 
well, Bobby Kennedy was determined not to let that happen again. So there was a general effort throughout the summer and fall of 1963 to get people into Cuba by legitimate means, not by secret boats in the middle of the night, as the CIA was capable of doing, but these would be people who would go in legitimately, would be able to walk the streets, talk to people, because this was very important for Project Freedom. They had to have ways of finding out what the man on the street thought about the coup, if they were going to support the new leaders. And indeed, there were many, many mysterious visits by young men in their early 20s to the Cuban embassy in Mexico City trying to get into Cuba for those kinds of activities. Oswald supposedly returned from a trip to Mexico City, a very enigmatic trip, uh, in which he made loud noises about getting a visa to Cuba at both the uh, Soviet and the Cuban embassies there and created quite a ruckus when he was turned down. Uh, this again established his bona fides as a Castro partisan. And I'm sure if it was actually Oswald, because there's a lot of evidence that it was not he but a double that showed up down there. And anywhere, his bona fides as a Castro uh, revolutionary were established. And upon his return to Dallas, he was in essentially the same role that he had been in New Orleans being dangled in this ongoing intelligence operation. And the final denouement, of course, was that this intelligence operation in which he was being uh, controlled uh, simply set him up to, to uh, take the tumble for the presidential assassination. Uh, they controlled him, and that's where he wound up, in the Dallas School Book building. Uh, and he was simply, like he said in his own words, the patsy. Tom and Lamar's detailed study of recently declassified documents has revealed a secret plan, part of Project Freedom, that was hijacked by Kennedy's killers, enabling them to escape detection. Beginning in September of 1963, several agencies in the U.S. government, at Bobby Kennedy's direction, began making contingency plans regarding Project Freedom. They were worried about what would happen if Castro found out about the plan and retaliated in some way. And so Bobby was faced with, with a, a serious problem here. He had a plan that had a very good chance of actually unseating Castro. What if Castro found out about it? And what if Castro found out about it before it happened and launched a preemptive attack of some sort against the United States? Not a military attack, but some sort of a, you know, a hit and run thing. What if he were, for example, to assassinate the U.S. ambassador to Panama or to Guatemala or something like this? And so Bobby had his advisors put together a series of contingency plans around this Cuban operation, these Cuban contingency plans uh, by the state. State Department, the FBI, the CIA, the Defense Department, um, people involved in them like Alexander Haig and, and, and Joseph Califano, uh, who, who put together this program that this is how we're going to respond if Castro does something against us, if he kills one of our people. And we want to very carefully control the, the release of information about the evidence. We want to control the evidence in a way that, that we can prevent inflammatory information from getting out that would cause the press to go nuts, that would cause the, the, the Republicans to use this as a, as a, as a, as a political tool, that would, that would cause Americans to demand an immediate invasion of Cuba that could lead to World War III. They had to have control of the information. There were very low-level operatives and informants working for the CIA whose primary allegiance was to the Mafia. And these people had been working with the Mafia for much longer than they had been working with the CIA. And the Mafia paid them many, many times what the CIA did. Uh, those people not only told the Mafia bosses like Traficante and Marcello about Project Freedom, but they worked with the Mafia in ways to use those plans to kill President Kennedy and use the secrecy surrounding Project Freedom to cover up the Mafia's role in it. Dangling Oswald, uh, the forces involved, I'm firmly convinced, were the same ones that were involved in the ongoing attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro. And I'm talking about the combination or the alliance between the CIA and the Mafia to snuff Castro. And I think that what happened at Dallas was simply that one that having the personnel and teams assembled for assassination, having the wherewithal to do it, having the intelligence connections to cover it up, that they simply turned their guns on Kennedy, and that's where it all came from, out of that whole collaboration between the mob and the CIA and some of the Cuban exiles. And I, I probably should add rogue elements of the CIA because I know that the director himself 
who was a Kennedy appointee, certainly was not involved. One of the more startling bits of evidence that Oswald was either a member of Project Freedom, part of the program, or that he had been manipulated in such a way that uh, Bobby Kennedy was certain that he was, uh, is found in an article written by a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who was in Washington, D.C. with one of the leaders of Project Freedom just hours after the assassination. And he received a telephone call from Bobby Kennedy just a few hours after Jack was killed. And Bobby's comment to him was, one of, one of your guys did it. One of your guys just killed my brother. And uh, this clearly demonstrates that Bobby's first response was that he recognized either Oswald's name or Oswald's position and that he believed that Project Freedom had been breached. And this also shows us how and why the Cuba contingency plans were immediately invoked, why the government would go to the lengths that it went to to violate state and federal law to seize John Kennedy's body from Dallas, take it to a federal facility in Bethesda, and, and on and on, all the other things. All of a sudden, it all makes sense. We know from sources who were actually working on Project Freedom that Robert Kennedy directed through intermediaries certain activities at the autopsy to make sure that national security considerations were observed with respect to the autopsy. And these considerations extended even after the autopsy was finished. Immediately after the autopsy, the body was then delivered into the care of, of then Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Haig, later Secretary of State Alexander Haig. And Haig, of course, was one of the authors of one of the Cuba contingency plans. It's very clear from all the conversations we've had with the people who were close to Bobby at that time, that he believed, at least in those early days, possibly weeks, that his program that he was responsible for, that he was running, had somehow been turned around or compromised and used to murder his brother, that he bore some personal level of responsibility for the death of his brother. I am very convinced that the assassination of John F. Kennedy came from the collaboration between the CIA and the Mafia in attempting to assassinate Fidel Castro. And I feel very strongly that that apparatus that was set up to assassinate Castro simply was turned on Kennedy when the motive piled upon motive to get rid of him. If the truth uh, came out today about what really happened, it certainly would be a major embarrassment to a number of political and media figures, and uh, I find that to be a very healthy thing. I think that people in this country should know how the government is able to cover up things that went on, not always by people being guiltily involved, but by just going along with what the government says. People that you trust betrayed you, the government that you trust, the official that you trust, and they told you blind light, and they knew it. So that kind of betrayal really turned your soul upside down. And for that, I'm angry. For all the Blakeys and Fords and God only knows whom, Posners and Mailers who had the opportunity to, to improve something, and they refused or sold out or were weak enough or whatever. But when that hope is taken away and you reduce human being like me to the level of the animal, even animal can feel. So you expect me not to protest? Sure I do. So this is, that's the reason that I'm here. Because nobody has right to play God over somebody else's life. And not just get away with it but be happy with that kind of power. This is just simply insanity. When the government engages in the truth-finding process and in some way doesn't tell us the truth, it's violated the very, very precepts upon which this government was founded. And those precepts are found if one wishes to look, not only in the Declaration of Independence, but in the Constitution, and particularly in the Bill of Rights. That is what guides this government. It is our founding principles. It matters. I think it is it's terrible just to know that a nation can have within its own government those kind of evil influences that can cause something like that to happen, and then to cause it to be covered up to the extent that it has been, makes you feel like you're really not in a democracy anymore.
A nation is strong when it does things openly, courageously, and according to the law. Amen.